I would have definitely been uh, much stronger for it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, your passion is infectious. You know, as uh, Rufina mentioned, I'm a clinician. I'm uh, an MBBS doctor by training, but I've got into the corporate world. And quite often, I engage in debates with various people. Most debates, as you can imagine, start at home. And uh, I remember several Saturdays ago, I was lounging with the newspaper and my wife asked me uh, if I know how to change a light bulb. Change a light bulb? I can do cesarean sections. I've delivered babies in auto rickshaws. And you asked me if I can change a light bulb. She said, good, go change the light bulb. Right? So the point, I, there are many lessons embedded there. But the lesson for me is that I'm extremely passionate about women's health. And this is something that I carry with me no matter where I go. And my team here also at Roche is very passionate about women's health. The other disease area that I'm personally passionate about is oncology. I'm part of a WhatsApp group with my medical college classmates. We have about 150 people. Most days it starts with good morning, good morning, good morning, happy birthday, happy birthday. But sometimes we engage in meaningful debate uh, about medical mysteries. Of course, as Ma'am said, the last few weeks we've been talking a lot about coronavirus. But sometimes I just throw a little bomb in there to say, okay, what is your opinion about HPV? What is your opinion about Paxinus? <coughs> And a lot of very diverse and divergent opinions come from the medical community. These are people who have been practicing for 15, 17, 18 years. And they are still talking about very rudimentary screening procedures. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about the pap smear versus HPV. I think ma'am has covered that very well. But the real point is, Many people, many educated people, people with resources, people who understand the consequences of screening and not screening, have not bothered to be screened. In my own family, I have many relatives who, who are vaguely aware of, about it, but they shrug and say, well, it won't happen to me, will it? The point is, we have a tool here where we can actually save lives where we can make an intervention, where we can make a clinical intervention that can save a life, that can save a family, that can save a community. Again, in the same WhatsApp group, some, some of my classmates, they talk about, oh, these days we're seeing so many cancer patients. Was it always like this? When we were studying MBBS, was it always like this? Did we see so many? I think today it's got a lot more. Now, the peculiar thing about statistics is, depending on which angle you look at it from, it is shaped differently. If you look at the absolute count of uh, cancer incidents, if you compare, say, 25, 30 years ago, early 1990s to today, yes, the absolute cancer count has gone up by 70%. Now, that is staggering. But then let's put it into context. In, during that period of 30 years, the population has also gro grown uh, quite substantially. So if you look at it as a population-adjusted number, Cancer has grown relative to the population by only 10%, which is also quite staggering. The incidence of cancer has grown by 10%. So it's oh wow. But then you think about it and you divide, you, you look at it closer, you peel off another layer, and then you do an age-adjusted cancer incidence. And if you look for a particular age or the age at which people die, and then you say, uh, what is the incidence of cancer? Then it is actually declining. So we have had a really powerful impact on the incidence of cancer when you look at it as a population over time and age adjusted. You just think 100 years ago, 20 to, 1920 to 2020, roughly three and a half generations, probably our grandparents' generation, that's when many of our grandparents were born. The average life expectancy at birth at that time, any idea, roughly, give or take? It was late 30s, 40 right? Between 35 and, and 40, depending on the country, depending on the geography, depending on the gender. Let's say it was uh, late 30s. Today, we're standing in 2020 and the average life expectancy at birth is double. And if you take some of the Scandinavian countries, you take Japan, but uh, treatment for diabetes was discovered. Surgical interventions were uh, introduced. So many things have happened. But the intervention that has had the most profound impact on life expectancy is public health, where the entire community with the government, the medical uh, community, as well as the people 
have got together, whether it's vaccination programs or what have you, wherever there has been a community intervention, there has been a surge in life expectancy at birth. And the point I'm making with that is unless we come together as a community, as a system, with the government, with the corporate setups, with families, with the medical community, unless we all come together as one and work on this, it's going to be very difficult to make an impact on a disease like cervical cancer. Today, we're sitting in such an august audience where people have the means, they have the resources, but we have an entire population and we have a responsibility and obligation. You know, women's health is a, women, is a woman's right. And we all have an obligation to support that. Today, if my wife were to ask me if I can change a light bulb, I don't know how I'll answer that question about the bulb, but what I can say for certain is that me, just like all of you sitting here, have a role to play in cervical cancer management and potentially saving lives. That, thank you very much.